It's great to be together this morning to worship at Grace Bible Church, and we will continue to do that in our time of communion this morning. Um, let's, again, we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's read together verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, having been kept in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Beginning in verse 3, the word Peter uses for blessed is always used in reference to God in the New Testament, and it means one worthy to be praised. Peter begins with the main idea that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is worthy to be praised. The primary motivation for praise in verse 3, you can see it in front of you, is that God has caused us to be born again. Believers are those who have been born again. It refers to a spiritual birth, no longer dead in sin, but alive in Christ. We have new life, new affections, new desires, new strengths. And it is this new birth that enables us to respond in faith and trust in Jesus Christ and submit to the message of the gospel. And as we see the riches of the new birth, it's Peter's intention that it would drive us to worship the Father. And in this passage, we'll quickly review five demonstrations in the new birth of God's praiseworthiness. The first demonstration of God's praiseworthiness is that our new birth exalts God's mercy. In verse 3, God's standard by which he provides believers eternal life is according to his great mercy. We deserve to bear the wrath of God for the sin in which we have lived, but God chose to set his electing love on us and show us his mercy when we were undeserving. When a sinner is born again, God's mercy is on display. God is also praiseworthy because, number two, our new birth illustrates God's sovereignty. In verse 3, it was God who caused us to be born again. Just as a newborn child did not cause their own birth, neither can we cause our second birth. Believers enjoy new life because of God's initiative in causing what we could not. Man's inability in the new birth puts God's sovereignty on display. God is also praiseworthy because our new birth magnifies Christ's resurrection, which grounds our hope. At the end of verse 3 through verse 5, we see three provisions that were secured for the believer by the new birth. The first, the unbelieving world knows only dying hopes, hopes that do not last and only disappoint. But believers have a living hope, an enduring hope. And those who are suffering are not to be dashed to the ground by their troubles. Instead, our eyes are fixed on what awaits us. The hope secured for us will become reality. Our living hope came to us through the new birth, but it was secured by the means, in verse 3, of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is living because our Savior lives. Our hope, which includes future resurrection, is secured because Christ himself rose from the dead. His resurrection to new life is the basis of our new birth to new life now and our hope of resurrection in the future. God is also praiseworthy because, number four, the, birth, the new birth secures for us a heavenly, eternal inheritance. God caused us to be born again in verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Our new birth as children of God grants us that to which children are customarily entitled to from their parents, an inheritance. Notice the end of verse 4. This inheritance is currently 
reserved in heaven for you. Uh, The believer's inheritance, despite our current experience of its spiritual benefits, including the new birth, is still future. Whether Jew or Gentile, an inheritance only awaits those who have been born again, who have experienced this new birth. In contrast to these believers' current experience of dispersion, trials, suffering, Notice how Peter describes the future inheritance, which is reserved in heaven, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. This heavenly inheritance that awaits believers, including an eternal sinless reality in a glorified body, in a heavenly kingdom, is great incentive for those who are suffering, reminding them that their tears, our tears will not last long. And that a great reward is laid up for those who have been born again. Lastly, God is worthy of our praise because the new birth guarantees our future salvation and a preserved faith. In verse 5, Peter describes the future inheritance in terms of salvation. Peter uses that term here in a future sense of being rescued from God's judgment and wrath on the last day. You can see that in 1 Peter 4. Peter assures his readers that they will certainly receive this future salvation from wrath. Why? In verse 5, believers are protected by the power of God. Believers may suffer agonizing pain now. Even Peter himself would be martyred for his faith. But God protects believers so that they will receive the final inheritance and experience the joy of that salvation. My life might be in danger, but my inheritance is not. Believers are actively protected by God. How? Verse 5, through faith. God's power does not shield believers from trials and sufferings, but it does protect us from the devastation of sin, which would cause us to fall away from our faith. God's power protects us because his power is the means by which our faith is actually sustained. Christian, your continuing faith is evidence of God's keeping and protecting work. When we see persevering faith in the midst of trials, we are seeing supernaturally preserved and protected faith. This does not remove the obligation to exercise continual faith for the believer, but it is alongside of God's preserving, protecting work. Believers, participate in communion this morning as an identification with the Lord Jesus Christ, as those who have been born again through faith in Jesus Christ. By partaking in this bread and drinking from the cup, we remember and proclaim his death on the cross as payment for sin. And we remember his resurrection from the dead until he returns and fulfills his promise. Believer, as you consider the new birth this morning, I pray that you would do as Peter intended for us to do in considering the new birth and worship God. Worship him for his sovereignty, for overruling our inability. He freed us from the penalty of sin by uniting us to his death and secured our eternal life. Our salvation, our inheritance, our hope with him by you also uniting us to his resurrection. He caused us to be born again and gave of us his Holy Spirit as a pledge of that very inheritance. Believer, perhaps this week you found yourself nearly undone by trials and by difficulties, or may you be you have been preoccupied with the world in front of you rather than the world to come. Maybe you've lost sight of the glories that await us in Christ. Maybe your faith, your trust, and your dependence on the Lord have felt small. Call out to the Lord in repentance and seek his help. He is both the author and perfecter of our faith and our protector. Follow him in humble faith and he will not disappoint. He will be faithful to all of his promises. Believer, take communion with us this morning, remembering his death until he comes again. If you are not a follower of Christ this morning, we're glad you're here. If you haven't repented of your sin, you haven't put your complete faith in Jesus Christ, if you have not been born again, you haven't experienced this new birth, which Peter has been talking about, we would ask that when the plate is passed in front of you, that you would let it pass. 
and don't take from it. But in the quietness of your heart, we would ask that you would ask the Lord to reveal the truthfulness of his word to you as you sit and listen. And I would invite you to come by after the service to find one of the elders, or you can come to the door on your left. And we would love to speak to you about what it means to trust in Christ for salvation and to experience the new birth. Men in the back, you can come forward in service now. Believers, as your hearts are prepared, you may take communion on your own this morning.